Welcome to Czech EOSC during Czech Presidency session uh, during the EOSC Symposium 2022 here in Prague, actually during the Czech Presidency. So welcome. We are really happy that you are here and we can together uh, talk about the implementation of European Open Science Cloud in the Czech Republic. Uh, as you can see, there are many, many speakers listed on the uh, on the screen, and we have a big panel of eight chairs. So we are going to use them all, and we will have several lighting talks at uh, several presentations. So uh, let me introduce only myself. My name is Jiří Marek. I work as Open Science Manager at uh, Masaryk University, and I'm also part of the AINFRA team uh, regarding the EOSC implementation in the Czech Republic. And as you can see, this is the session plan. First, we will start with the pre uh, presentation of Professor Matiska uh, by introducing, introducing the Czech implementation of EOSC. Then we will have several lighting talks, actually seven of them. So it will be five minutes for each speaker. I will be kind of strict. I have for you the list with the paper uh, with one minute, you know, for the speakers. So this will be the, your last minute, and then I will try to uh, try to um, tell you. Let's move on, and then we will have what's uh, also very important panel discussion. You can ask questions. Uh, we are going to uh, talk between each other, and I'm going going to moderate also the panel discussion. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome here uh, Mr. Matiska. Professor Matiska from the AIN Francaise to give the first presentation. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Once again, welcome here in Prague uh, on this uh, session about EOSC implementation in the Czech Republic. And I will speak a little bit about the steps which we are taking within the country to actually start a wide country uh, or countrywide implementation of EOSC. And you will see the individual steps in the uh, fresh talks which will be following mine. So just to get the broad context, I mean, we are here at our symposium. We, we all know that the broad context is about open science principles and especially about the fair data. And for the Czech Republic, we decided to focus all the activities around EOSC implementation really on support for the uh, fair research data. So EOSC CZ, the EOSC in Czech Republic, is seen as a federation of fair data and related services, exactly as it is described at the higher level. But we will see in a few minutes how we actually want and plan to implement such a federation. And the point is that we are making this federation as an open ecosystem, which we expect to be evolving in the future. And that will be not closed, not, not technologically, nor by processes, nor by the uh, say properties to actually be able to, uh, to support the future evolution of EOS as it will happen also uh, Europe-wide and eventually the global open science cloud, uh, the global one. So the, the, the basic principles for the EOS uh, in the Czech Republic were set up in the last year during the spring uh, and early summer or especially spring 2021 when under the auspices of the ministry of education youth and sports which is also responsible for many of the research activities related uh, and also especially uh, responsible for the research infrastructures and their funding uh, under the auspices of this ministry we came out with a document which is called the architecture of EOSC implementation in the Czech Republic, which lays down the principles how we would like to actually implement EOSC in the Czech Republic. And the, I would say the primary goal and the primary outcome of these discussions as described in the document is the idea of the national data infrastructure, which naturally is not something completely unexpected, but uh, we see here how we actually tried to describe it in more detail and we defined four key components i will get to these components a little bit later in a little bit more detail but the components are the metadata directory where we would like to keep and you will hear about it a little bit more in the uh, immediately following flash talk then we will have the national repository platform at the basis for storing data and creating and defining the core standards and core services. We will connect into the national uh, data infrastructure the thematic uh, 
repositories either existing or evolved uh, as a part of the fair data evolution and dealing with fair data within the research fair data within the country. And last but not least, we will also have a pillar dedicated to education and training because we are very well aware that we will not actually achieve the goals without encouraging people about encouraging researchers, but also without helping them and training, educating the new generation of researchers to actually understand the potential and real benefits of open science and EOSC as a tool to move forward such a thing. We also get, that was a part of the discussion with the ministry, we also get a rather nice support uh, financially wide. Uh, which is based through the fact that the EOSC implementation in the Czech Republic will be supported through the European Structural Funds, and there is approximately 120 million euros allocation or pre-allocation for the year 23 to 28 for the next six-year period. Several calls are under discussion. The first call is already out, and this is the call for two specific projects or, or funding for two specific projects, which will create the commonalities and the background for actual implementation of EOSC uh, in the Czech Republic. The second call is currently under preparation. The call is expected to be open early 2023, and this will be a call dedicated to the national research platform. The core, as I said, and also its uh, major services, but also covering partly the education and uh, training uh, activities. The next call, which is expected, which is now just in the initial phase of the discussion, is for the thematic services, thematic clusters, and then we will follow with a kind of uptake and upskilling to cover the whole research community within the country. And here you see the approximate uh, allocations of these 120 million euros uh, for the whole uh, say, activity. The governance for the EOSC in the Czech Republic is again with the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports. There is a coordination board for EOSC, which is co-chaired by two vice ministers. So this is really a high level a body to steer or to oversee the whole implementation. Uh, to actually help this from the bottom, we established working groups, which were already described in the document I presented earlier or I mentioned earlier. We have uh, currently four working group on foundations, the architecture, for the whole national data infrastructure, the metadata, the core services, and the training and education working group. And then we have seven plus one thematic working groups, which are conceived as a kind of a seeds for the future cluster thematic projects uh, within the second call I presented. Here you see this uh, seven plus one. Plus one is that the last one is not thematic itself. It is kind of a cross cutting because it is about sensitive data, uh, but it relates naturally both to the core and national research platform and also to quite a few, if not all, of the thematic services. And as you We'll see most of the flash talks are somehow related, and the people here are uh, those who will be presenting here uh, uh, from the work from these working groups. Uh, I said the national data infrastructure has two key components and two supporting, I would say, horizontal principles. The two key components are this national metadata directory and the national repository platform. Uh, the, repo the directory is considered as a key core component to be actually implemented as a part of this EOSC CZ project, which is under the first call, which is just to be submitted. And it will uh, kind of create a generally core top level. Uh, um, again, we will hear about it in the next uh, in the next flash talk. The national repository platform is a key because it is not only the capacity and the but uh, and the uh, say and the services to actually create virtual repositories on it to deal with them to work with the data, but it will also create the whole uh, access control system, which is also used for the metadata directory, and it will especially define standards 
And with collaboration with the thematic clusters, it will define standards to connect the thematic repositories and to steer the future development. So we will be able to support heterogeneous environment, technically process-wide, while keeping standards to assure the full uh, technical and also uh, higher level interoperability within the national data. Uh, infrastructure. And I said to, as a part, the human resources, training and education, and then the existing or eventually new thematic repositories, which we would like to connect. We have no aim, no goal to uh, somehow negatively influence the effort which was already put into setting up, developing, and operating thematic repositories. But with these interventions, we would like to help them to proliferate further, to get wider audience of people, to help them eventually to verify a little bit more what they have as research data within their repositories. And especially, we would like to support them to make sure that they follow the standards as defined by the national repository platform to be able to fit seamlessly into the whole national data infrastructure uh, environment and ecosystem. So, and naturally support also development of new repositories in case that it makes sense. Here, we expect a close collaboration with national large research infrastructures because it's practically all, in all cases, the existing thematic repositories are somehow developed under the auspices of the research infrastructures. And naturally, also the plans are mostly related to that. And as I said, we are dealing specifically with the sensitive data area to make sure that the repositories will not be restricted to non-sensitive data only, and that the people who are dealing with sensitive data, which are a huge group of researchers, will be left out. So that's why we are focusing on that. So to, to summarize our goals is that the idea of the implementation of EOS within the Czech Republic is to create the national data infrastructure as a complex system which, has, which, which deals with the basic infrastructure for the sufficient capacity open a set of key and other services. And this is the, 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 the emphasis is on the open, because we don't expect to use one technology to rule them all, but to actually create a mosaic of, uh, uh, of technologies, uh, of, of pieces, which will allow us to evolve gradually as the technologies will change, as the requirements will change, and not being stuck with something which is too large to fail, but also to, uh, to be adapted to future needs. And we will have the National Metadata Directory and National Repository Platform as the key points or key elements of this whole ecosystem. The human resources are already mentioned, and I also mentioned that the thematic services and the thematic repositories are important and non, say, negotiable, I would say, part of the whole national data infrastructure. The goal is to support the people who are already working in this area, who are already developing something or keeping, taking care of operating, to, to actually help them to fit into this larger uh, and more complex ecosystem. Ah, good. Uh, so here is a, a kind of a picture to uh, demonstrate what we are trying to develop. You also see by color where we think the support will go. We, will, we see that also in a larger scheme, there is also a part which deals with the I would say bibliographic data, but I will not delve into it in, in any detail, but this is here. We have a central discovery portal above even the national metadata, metadata directory, and here there are the paths, and this is what we expect to actually primary support through the intervention for the EOSC uh, in the Czech Republic. So as a summary, to conclude this, EOSC for us, 
And also, as I am coming from a primary to e infrastructure uh, within the Czech Republic, it is the move from compute centric to the data centric view. So that the strong support, we have strong support for this move and transition from the ministry. You had seen the potential allocations. And for the e infra CZ, the large research infrastructure, e infrastructure within the country, we are in fact taking this as reshaping our core businesses as a part of the move from the compute to data center. View. We see it as the evolution of, uh, as, a, as an opportunity, and also a challenge, opportunity to evolve the national e infrastructure. But the key point here is that while the national e infrastructure is developed and operated by just three uh, institutions, the goal here is to have much more institutions directly involved in building, operating, and expanding the national data infrastructure and using it in a way that it will not be just for few uh, somewhere explicitly supported, but that it will be a really a baseline for the whole research activities, for all the research activities within the country. We have also support even the legislative support because the data management plans and related stuff is becoming obligatory for the national funding. And this is our step forward to actually help researchers to create an environment where it will not be just additional bureaucratic burden, but it will be really a help for them to have the data better managed, better prepared, better organized, being able to share the data in a much more easier way than the case is now. The human resources, so the point is, what we are trying to do as the EOSC implementation in the Czech Republic is this national, open national data infrastructure, which we hope through the architecture design, it will be evolvable and it will be a basis for helping researchers to deal with the fair data and doing so in a manageable and I mean, easy to do and supported way to actually help them not to only fulfill the requirements for the say data management plans for the verification, but also to provide them an environment where they will themselves find out that having better organization on their data, making them really fair not just as a label, but as the core, uh, will also make their own life much easier and their research better. And that's all. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor. Please sit on the panel. And now I would like to ask uh, Mr. Martin Svoboda, the director of National Technical Library, to give his presentation about metadata interoperability in the Czech EOS. Please. Mr. Svoboda, the floor is yours. First I, would like <coughs> First, I would like to correct. We are not technical library. We are National Library of Technology. But this is a small uh, detail. Uh, well, before I start, uh, I would like to mention that, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, our contribution to the EOSC implementation in Czech Republic uh, started even before it was conceived by the Ministry of Education because the, because the concept of our project cards, uh, as we uh, call uh, our project, also under the auspices of Ministry and also under the uh, operation program uh, Jana Moskumenius, uh, was, uh, was prepared already uh, some two years, three years ago. But uh, in, in our project, we have, uh, we have two components. One, as was mentioned by Professor Matiska, is the bibliographic or uh, document component of the whole uh, ecosystem. And the other one is the uh, component of uh, supporting EOSC, implementation of EOSC CZ by uh, providing services necessary to keep the metadata as consistent as possible. So that it is, so that the data could really be uh, not only f uh, fair, but not only not only uh, findable, but also to be uh, interoperable and uh, usable, which is uh, impossible without having good uh, quality uh, metadata. <coughs> uh, 
So uh, the purpose of the uh, of this component of the, our project, uh, Czech uh, Academic and Research Discovery Services, is uh, uh, creation of the uh, of the new uh, department within NTK with the National Library of Technology, which serves as a supporting and consulting uh, center for data uh, for met management of metadata uh, necessary for uh, uh, data sets. So uh, we will develop a possibly universal or central or standard mo metadata model that will be extended for each uh, uh, specific uh, uh, data types, uh, be it uh, topical data in subject repositories or uh, in whichever, uh, whichever uh, uh, whichever directions of the of the science and uh, also the uh, procedures how to work best with metadata and uh, we will uh, we will also help with uh, with uh, processing the metadata for from uh, subject clusters that are already existing so the per the the, in the tool the instrument uh, that will that will uh, serve this purpose is the national repository catalog which is uh, containing on our plan this is not yet existing but this is our plan that it will uh, uh, that will it will concentrate the open operational operational information about the repositories who is the owner? How, fre how frequent uh, is it? What is the met central metadata scheme? Uh, what is the possible size of the repository, and so on? Th and this information could allow us uh, to to manage the uh, the services uh, for of the of the uh, metadata working uh, working group as uh, as well as uh, possible. Uh, Quite a natural way, uh, we became the leader of the of the uh, EOSC CZ implementation metadata working group, and uh, yeah, this is our this is our contribution and this is our uh, communication with the with the implementers of the uh, of the EOSC CZ. Uh, also, uh, as a uh, important component is the um, support for um, permanent uh, persistent identifiers. Uh, we already have in the NTK uh, ISSN center since decades. And now we, added, we are adding two uh, other types of, um, of uh, per persistent identifiers, ORCID yeah, uh, and uh, digital object identifiers. So this is a, a little bit another view of the scheme that was presented by uh, preceding presentation. So the, the, uh, this is the bibliographic part. It is containing data from catalogs, also from document repositories. And beside that, there is the activity three, which is uh, considering on the, uh, concentrating on the national catalog, metadata management and uh, persistent identifier management. So this is the way how to concentrate, provide these services, and I think that's about it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Next presentation, please, about Data Steward, what's the Data Steward, and from Dagmar Hanslikova from the Center of Open Science at Charles University Central Library. The floor is yours. Thank you. So hello, thank you everybody, thank you uh, Yiji for introducing me. Uh, so in this short presentation I'm going to talk about uh, data stewards and implementing data stewards in the Czech Republic. Uh, when you're implementing a new infrastructure such as EOSC, uh, what is it that you need? Of course you need resources, you need people who build the infrastructure, you need some clear policies and guidelines on who's allowed to use the infrastructure under what conditions, but having the infrastructure is not enough. You also need people who know about the infrastructure and who are willing and able to use the infrastructure. So you need trained researchers who will very often need to learn how to organize their data a bit differently, how to work a bit differently in accordance with the FAIR principles. And in order to do that, they will need some support. So you will need some trained support staff as well. So <clears throat> for that purpose, uh, in February 2022, 
We established a working group for education and human resources, which is led by Radka Žimanová, who is the director of Charles University Central Library. I'm her sidekick. Uh, the group at the moment has 35 members uh, from across 20 different institutions and our aims are to have trained researchers and to have trained research support staff. Uh, in terms of training researchers, uh, this part received a bit less attention so far, uh, but basically what we need to do is to identify what skills do researchers need to have. There is some basic knowledge that everybody needs to have. Then there is something subject specific that, for example, like GDPR, which people who work with personal data will need a bit more skills than that. Uh, and of course, how do they acquire these skills? At the moment, uh, it happens mostly ad hoc at the level of individual institutions. Um, it's mostly uh, individual consultations or one-off lectures and workshops. Uh, some universities, however, try to provide a bit more systematic learning already. So, for example, Masaryk University prepared a paid lifelong learning course on data stewardship <coughs> and data security. Uh, which is open to everybody. Uh, Charles University prepared a free online uh, e-learning course on research data management, again, available for everyone. Uh, and the University of uh, Chemistry and Technology piloted a data stewardship course, uh, which uh, will become free uh, in uh, next year or something. So it might spread to other universities as well. Um, but our main focus so far uh, has been on training research support staff. In particular, the position of a data steward, who is a person who's supposed to help researchers organize and manage their data in accordance with FAIR principles so that they would be uh, suitable to put into this infrastructure because unless we have that, it's going to be garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so for many institutions, this is a new thing, a new position. So uh, what we prepared was a job profile with a list of skills and competencies that data stewards should have. Uh, this list can be used by institutions or research teams who are looking for data stewards or posting job adverts, so they can just basically copy paste it or uh, add some modifications um, and use it easily. And uh, the things that inst many institutions ask us in terms of how to implement the position uh, at an institution because money matters in both senses of the phrase, uh, where is it an admin or a research position? Uh, because, for example, at Charles University, they uh, understood this position or they saw this position as an admin who is going to fill out the form for the funder. So why do we need you know, all, this, all this jazz? Uh, so we had to explain that it's a different kind of position, that it's someone who's supposed to help the researchers, assist them with uh, managing their data, organizing their data a bit differently. So it's a bit closer to the research position, uh, actually. Uh, and another thing they wondered about is whether it was a project-based or an institutional position, whether it should be funded from grant money for a specific period of time, or whether it is something that the institution should provide and maintain on the institutional level. Uh, the answer to those questions was basically, well, it depends. Uh, so we prepared uh, three models of implementations uh, that depend on the size and internal structure of each, in, uh, of each institution. So different models might be uh, suitable for different universities. And on the last slide, I would like to introduce these models briefly. Uh, so the first model uh, is suitable mainly for larger universities with very diverse uh, internal structures, such as Charles University, which has 17 faculties, ranging from arts and humanities to health and medical sciences. Uh, and it includes some uh, central support team, like the Open Science Support Center, uh, which is more of an admin team, although we do have some research background. Uh, then we would coordinate a network of faculty data stewards uh, who would have a bit more in-depth knowledge into uh, some subject-specific matters. Uh, and who would also serve as a sort of a contact point between us and the researchers and the data stewards at the research uh, team level. Um, and then we would have uh, data stewards who would already be uh, more of a research positions at the, in at the level of the research team of the individual lab, who would be assisting directly the researchers with preparing data management plans and things like that. Uh, the second model might be more suitable for uh, institutions that are not that large. Um, so they would have the central support team and it might be enough for them to have uh, the data stewards at the level of the faculty or the institute. If the institution is not that large, if there are enough data stewards, they might be able to cover 
the needs of their research team at their institutions. Uh, and the last model, the model three, uh, relies on the central support team uh, and the individual um, research teams, which would have their own uh, data stewards at the level of the, uh, of the lab. So this model would be better for institutions, for example, which are not as internally diverse, so they would not need to have these contact points with subject-specific knowledge, and it could be covered uh, by the central support team. So we hope that uh, the materials that we prepare will be useful for uh, other institutions, and we're looking forward to having more data stewards in the Czech Republic in the near future. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Dasha. And now the another one is Professor Kaklanova with environmental sciences, em, environmental health sciences. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. So I'm the first one who should talk about uh, different topics from the working groups. And the first one is environment. And I don't say just environment. I say environmental health scientist, because many people who are from this domain are not only focused on the changing environment, but also at the drivers of those changes. So there is a lot of link between the society and the environment, and then also on environmental health impact. So it means what elements from the environmental factors do have a direct or indirect impact on the individual or population health. So the same way as we are looking at the functional exposomic, it means the genetic that is being translated through different omics to the phenotype, uh, we have the same view of environmental factors that can impact various levels from the organism, organ, organ level to the organism level. We are using the concept of internal and external exposome, which means the universe of factors, and including environmental and social factors, that are behind development of the chronic conditions. Uh, these data are instrumental for implementation of some European policies, including the chemical strategy for Europe, but also the Green Deal, because not only climate, but also zero pollution ambition are very important for implementation of the European strategies. A uh, big challenge is that there is a lot happening at the European level because there is a new European partnership on chemical risk assessment that was established last year and it is focusing a lot on environmental data and their uh, importance for assessment of the environmental risks. Uh, so it means we need to collaborate and also reflect the decisions and findings from the European partnerships, European human exposome projects, project, clust project clusters on uh, chemicals as uh, the endocrine disruptors and similar. We need to create the challenges because uh, if you look at the, the green picture to the left side, it shows all different domains dealing with the environmental data. They are coming from geocoded data, the satellite data through the water, air, indoor environment, geo data, and, and so on. And also, uh, the environmental impacts are relevant for many human projects, looking into the neurodevelopment, metabolic diseases, cardiometabolic uh, conditions, and similar. So when we are talking about data types that this group needs to work with, uh, we are coming from the data uh, on environmental monitoring networks and field studies. Uh, they include, again, the quality of air, water, but also food and feed, or indoor environment. Uh, we need to look into the questionnaire data coming from longitudinal population studies, data on their social economic conditions, lifestyles, health. We need to work with data from the health registers, but also uh, sample collections and biobanks are important resource. So the structure of the data coming from those different domains is very different. And the working scheme that you can see on the picture really comes from environmental data, population data, to the laboratory. And we are talking about different types of laboratory, the targeted laboratories for assessment of chemical mixtures, metabolomic, metagenomic, genetic, toxicological testing, and, and similar. 
But there is also close collaboration with the social domain because all those people that participate in the clinical or population studies are also providing a lot of social and economic data. So it means uh, in our cluster we do have a number of the research infrastructures looking at various aspects of environmental sciences, but we have several, insti uh, several universities and institutes of the Academy of Science, but we also envisage the large collaboration with the infrastructures from other domains, especially health, uh, lifestyle, food, and also social and humanities. Thank you. So thank you very much. And this was the first uh, thematic presentation from the working groups. And now we are going to continue with Anička Strachutová. Please welcome. And we are going to talk about the biohealth and food cluster. So Anička. The floor is yours. Thank you. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or afternoon, actually. I'm here instead of Piotr Vondrašek, uh, who is the coordinator of this working group, and he's currently abroad. So I'll try to introduce his presentation myself. So wish me luck. <laughs> um, as I already mentioned, uh, Jerzy Vondrašek is the coordinator of this working group. He is a head of bioinformatics group in, uh, at the Institute of Organic Chemistry and Biochemistry. And at the same time, he is the director of Elixir CZ uh, Infrastructure, which is the national infrastructure of biological, for biological data and life science. So uh, while we're creating this working group, actually, uh, we thought we should be able to accommodate more data from more, da uh, more scientific disciplines than just in life science. That data of life science is, has been closely, or closed, uh, there has been a close connection with other fields, and uh, such as food and nutrition or uh, health. We would like to create a data space for open science and uh, create a friendly environment and, uh, for a user. In our working group, uh, many, many institutions is involved. We have uh, numbers of uh, universities, we have numbers of uh, research institutes of Academy of Science, uh, we also have uh, faculty hospitals, and but, uh, last but not least, we have representatives from entire infrastructures. When we are talking about data, uh, many terms need to be clarified. We, uh, in the initial part of working with the data as a plan, collection, process, and analyze, the data can be accommodated at the institutional level. But when it comes of preservation, sharing, and reusing, we need somehow join the forces, and uh, somehow we need these federated repositories and things like that. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the previous slide, we have a number numerous uh, numbers of institutions involved, wide range of institutions, which actually means that we have wide range of data. Uh, we are dealing with uh, structural data, we are uh, sequences data, but also with the large uh, imagining data, which, uh, for example, has a specific requires for preservation, such as uh, local preservation at the institutes or if it comes for a data transfer speed, they have to be preserved on the um, netbone network. And we also have, so we need to deal with the technical issues as well as, uh, for example, as I mentioned, we have a health data included in our bio, uh, bio health food working group. And uh, we discuss a lot this overlapping with sensitive data. So uh, first of all, we need to be sure what does it mean for us, the sensitive data for, from the life science point of view, or what, what does it mean for working group sensitive data? And actually, who will treat this data or manage this data, and how we will manage this data at the edge? So uh, first of all, we talk about the classification of this data 
we try to uh, classificate those data according to GDPR, then we find out that it's not enough for us and we need to uh, be more specified. But what we agreed on with the sensitive, sensitive uh, data working group is that as far as we will clarify the sensitive data in our working group, we will move those data to under the management of sensitive data working group. Um, Yuri also wanted to mention uh, that Elixir has actually, uh, or it uh, contributes with EOSC for a long time, and Elixir established or published um, guidelines, principles, guiding principles on fair data management already in 2017. And in this working group, we would like to uh, be, uh, be doing all activities according to these principles, fulfill fair principles, and create the environment for users, for researcher, and help them to manage all data with bio health and food areas. Thank you. So thank you very much for the, another traumatic presentation. And now we go to uh, Academy of Science. And please, Marek, uh, come here and your presentation about the uh, NAMIDAS decentralized data repository for active communities. So floor is yours. Thank you, Jirka. Uh, and thanks for coming. I represent here a group of uh, material sciences and engineering, or technologies, as we call it, in uh, Czech Republic. and. Uh, we have the, the group working group has 20, 26 members coming from 14 universities and research institutes and importantly in this uh, working group we focus on covering re uh, really all corners of Czech Republic so also some uh, much smaller high education institutions uh, because engineering and material sciences are quite common research uh, objects in Czech Republic, also in these smaller units. Uh, the group is uh, orientated also on uh, experimental, but also on uh, researchers who are coming, uh, who are working with computational approaches. So it's pretty diverse, as similarly to many other working groups. So actually, our aims do not differ that much from from the other groups you already heard. So I will just. Uh, uh, mention or summarize here that the aim is to map needs of uh, Czech uh, MSE community for storage and sharing and now I'm using a little bit different abbreviation FAIR with an index T and I will explain it in a second what I mean by that. Uh, we want to design the, the, the we, we design in the working group uh, domain specific repository and we are getting involved in development of international uh, standards for research data management. So what FAIR T means here, as uh, it was already mentioned many times, the focus is on FAIR data, the principles are well established, and the FAIR means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, so there is something missing for us everyday scientists. And that's trust, if these data are trustworthy. And now I'm not speaking of a data quality from data point of view, but from a scientific point of view. So what we would be very happy if our repository can uh, be focused on so-called fair T data, or at least to that the repository in also indicates to some level uh, the verification state, I mean scientific verification state of the data. And also with partners from, uh, some partners from the working group, or, but also for, with some partners from uh, European, other in European institutions, we are uh, uh, forming a consortium which is preparing a project with the acronym NAMIDAS. And what does this project should do? We want to test, oops. We want to in stimulate formation of small communities, really small, 10, maximum 100 uh, members. And within these communities, we suggest to share the data as much as possible. And if uh, I'm speaking sharing data, I don't mean now the 
classical ar archiving, the, the data which are already processed and uh, the later stage of, of the uh, process, but I really mean immediately after the data were produced and during the early phase of their processing, start sharing it. And for this, we need to have access to the computers or maximally some uh, storage spaces of the individual uh, researchers all around the, probably even the planet, at least Europe. Yeah. So how to do it? Is this system easy? This system cannot be done by a standard centralized repositories. It should be, uh, we suggest that it is important to create uh, decentralized community repositories with so-called web-based architecture. What does it mean? Uh, we suggest that it will be built on linked data principles and metadata models, but that's already implemented in many, uh, in, in some of the systems to some extent, but we, we suggest to use solid pods and solid principles which enable social networking uh, like technology to help people really communicate about this uh, fast creating data. And we believe that this will lead to the uh, ability to evaluate the data and stimulate the transfer of the data. This means that the data sets will be, for example, color coded that the data set was fully evaluated. You can trust it, partially evaluated or not evaluated. Of course, this may be also split that the not evaluated or pulled, uh, suggested that this data set is not really according to the standards. Oops. But we also suggest that to, we also want to test it in uh, different small communities which are, can be related like nanofabrication and solar energy community. This is relatively close, these two small communities, but we have also in the project prepared immunomicrosquare or advanced immune imaging for the and he, uh, community and the interoperability of the system should be tested. Thank you very much for your interest. Okay, thank you very much, Marek. And now we move to Linda Services for EOSC. Uh, please, Pavel Straniak from Charles University and floor is yours. Hello, my name is Pavel Straniak. Um, I'm also standing here for a chair of the working group uh, who is Jan Heij and who cannot be here today. Um, as said, I'm from Charles University and from the from um, a large research infrastructure called Lindat Clarin or Lindat Claria, sorry, name changes in time. Um, we are heading this uh, this working group for arts and humanities um, and for data in, in this domain. And the main aim of the working group is actually very simple. It's kind of a emphasis on the four principles in in the domain of arts and humanities which means mostly that the data should be stored and preserved, which is still not a very standard. For instance, no Czech uh, funding agency currently has a requirement to preserve data. So even if you plan uh, and if you get a grant to create some data set, then you can get by by writing a monograph, uh, you know, some publications about the data, but there's no requirement that you actually store the data after the project is over. So we want to we want to slowly change change the landscape in this in this area, and of course uh, of course uh, we also want to do it via emphasis on data management plans as as was mentioned before and training as as Dagmar mentioned, but the substantial part will be also uh, the technical solutions actually that that we can provide, and uh, one part is uh, Lindat language technologies. So, so we provide some language technology services like machine translation and various types of analysis, uh, analysis of data sets uh, via REST APIs. The services are completely open, but that's not the part I will be talking about today. Uh, I want to talk about the other part, and that's actually the solution for the data sets and their preservation and you know, according to the four principles. So uh, repositories. And uh, we provide uh, one specific solution called Clarin DSpace, which is a modification of DSpace repository um, that was originally created uh, uh, for ourselves, for our research infrastructure. 
So Linda and Claria is part of two Eric's. One is Clarin Eric, one is Daria Eric. And within the Clarin, we, that this is the community that, that kind of started uh, preserving language data. And we quickly came uh, to understand that the standard repositories, we started using DSpace simply because it was easy to install and cheap and so on. And we didn't have much funding, right? So, so we, we needed a repository system that doesn't need additional development that you can simply start using and it, and, it f and it already fulfills most of the criteria. So for instance, for Fedora, you would have to develop your own front end back then when we were starting. Um, but the repositories needed some, some additional changes. And the crucial one is, um, is uh, so-called licensing framework. I will talk about it later, that uh, in the language data domain, uh, not all data can be, uh, can be open, of course. Um, so we started this development, now it's called Clarin DSpace, uh, it's completely open, uh, most development is still done by our research infrastructure, but um, lately a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of commitment from, from other partners too. Uh, Oxford University is running our repository system too, they committed a lot of effort this year, so we are on a very good track to, to upgrade our repository to the latest code base of DSpace. And We've been doing this for about 13 years now, and I think that the solution is quite solid. Uh, the main features that we that we developed, that we modified the DSpace for, is one of them not mentioned. Oh, yeah, mentioned later on, is the one that you see immediately when you come to our repository. It looks different than the than the default DSpace because we've hidden the hierarchies of communities and collections, and it's more centered around search interface. Um, We've modified it for different types of persistent identifiers. The crucial one that I mentioned is the licensing framework. So any license uh, that the data provider says, you know, we, we want to share this data set, but we cannot give it an open license, for instance, for privacy concerns or for copyright uh, concerns, which is the most uh, often the case uh, in our system. Anything can be handled by the DSpace uh, modified so the Clarin D space. And uh, you can see the quick overview of the integrations. So if you install, if you install Clarin D space, then out of the box it has these integrations working. So any data set that gets into the system, you know, you, you, you ingest a new data set, it will be visible in Google Scholar, in Google Dataset Search, it will be visible in OpenAir, uh, in Data Citation Index of Clarivate, and it can be backed up via UDAT services, uh, visible in B2Find. So all of these things work out of the box. And that's, yeah, uh, it's, it's been now installed in about 15 places, most of them within Clarion Network, but not all of them. So the last point is, is why I'm talking about it here. We propose to use this repository system as part of the national repository uh, platform so that other institutions can quickly start up their um, the repository and it will already be conforming to, to all of these requirements and have all these nice features integrated. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. So thank you very much. And last but not least, please welcome Jindřich Krejčí uh, and his presentation about the role of social sciences and data services. So please welcome. Thank you, good afternoon. So, social sciences. So first of all, I would like to uh, say, uh, uh, or point, out, point to uh, a specific added value which comes uh, with uh, domain data archives or topical thematic data archives. Uh, there are two, uh, two important uh, uh, objectives behind uh, uh, establishing EOSC and uh, behind uh, opening access to research data in general. And the first of uh, uh, the tasks or objectives is uh, to make data reusable, which uh, is based on the fact that uh, simply not only the final research publications, but also data have a great potential to, to contribute into, uh, the, uh, into uh, transfer, transfer of knowledge within the scientific knowledge cycle. And uh, the, uh, uh, the second objective is uh, in uh, 
uh, in increasing uh, quality of uh, research and that's uh, done uh, beside others also by more transparency of research because if uh, the research should be reproduced you simply need uh, uh, access uh, to the data which were, were used for, uh, for analysis. Uh, if you have these uh, two objectives, what do, do you need? Not only uh, the storage place for the data and uh, procedures for the protection and uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, data preservation, but you need uh, also permanent uh, curation of data. You need to build uh, ways to access the data. And uh, if you want uh, to use or reuse the data beyond uh, the original uh, team which uh, that created the data, you need also uh, to make data understandable. And uh, it's specifically here, not also in these uh, three other parts of uh, or things you need, uh, uh, but also speci but specifically here, uh, you need specific specialized knowledge which uh, may come from uh, domain or topical thematic data archives. Uh, of course, also these uh, three other parts, uh, uh, our uh, domain data archives are able to, to contribute because there are different types of data, different procedures, different standards and uh, different confusion behind the archival uh, work. So if you don't want to build a uh, data repository as a black box, you need not only centralization, but you need also the specialization, uh, which uh, may come from, uh, from particular, or need to come from particular uh, uh, research domains. Uh, concerning social sciences, uh, uh, data archives were created uh, very soon, uh, practically with uh, some widespread of, widespread of uh, computers in 1950s and 1960s. Uh, in Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic, uh, the first efforts were also in the uh, uh, 1960s, but uh, uh, because uh, the Russian tanks come instead of uh, founding of the, the archive, so the, uh, the first national data archive was created in uh, 1998 and later it was developed into Czech social science data archive, which has a wider scope, not only sociology. Uh, creation of these uh, social science data archives was always uh, based on the, uh, on the finding that uh, uh, virtual data are something different from, uh, from normal material or from, from books, uh, which uh, can be stored in some shelf. Uh, but uh, archivation of virtual data uh, requires permanent, uh, permanent uh, curation. Uh, other thing is that uh, these archives were created uh, by researchers and uh, it was very much in response to their needs. So the first thing uh, uh, which was behind uh, these efforts was uh, to make uh, data reusable because researchers, of course, they want to, uh, to have data, to access the data. Uh, for uh, their secondary uh, for secondary analysis in their research. Uh, other thing is that uh, in social sciences uh, uh, the specific uh, uh, value uh, is uh, comes from uh, uh, comparative research. Uh, that's not only from uh, from because of knowledge which comes from comparisons uh, in time or uh, uh, across nations. But it, uh, it comes also from the fact that uh, social sciences are not so much experimental. Uh, so uh, we need uh, uh, to, we need uh, uh, <coughs> uh, com comparisons as a specific method for, uh, uh, for uh, 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 providing evidence. So uh, beside data archives, archives as such, uh, there are also longitudinal and international comparative research programs uh, which are also based on uh, data sharing. So simply if you need uh, to compare things in time, you need uh, data from the previous, uh, previous times. Uh, how it looks in the Czech Republic now. So there is a landscape. Uh, on one side, uh, uh, there are researchers at the universities, Academy of Science and uh, public research institutes. Uh, there are data producers, uh, there are data users at the same time. 
and uh, uh, they, they are used to, to, to accessing uh, uh, different uh, data resources which are available uh, for relatively long and uh, uh, they are more or less aware that uh, they should uh, contribute into, uh, into that uh, data sharing, data culture which is necessary for, uh, for uh, having such uh, services. On the other, other side, uh, times are changing, so more and more data uh, which are used in social sciences is located uh, uh, outside of uh, academic sector. So there are new data types because uh, society is more and more digitalized and produce a lot of data. And uh, other thing is there are also research infrastructures uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, I have already mentioned the, the archive, Czech Social Science Data Archive. Uh, there are several uh, longitudinal and uh, uh, international uh, comparative programs. Uh, you can see the list which is not complete because there are more and more such efforts, uh, not only on international level but also on a national level. Of course, there are many, many programs which are contributing into, uh, into international programs. And uh, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, research infrastructures are integrated into the European research area, uh, that uh, European research infrastructure, so-called ESFRI like CESDA, SHARE and European Social Surveys and uh, 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 they are uh, organized in clusters like SHOCK, uh, Social Sciences and the Humanities Open Cloud which uh, contributes uh, to development of uh, EOSC. So practically these ways how to contribute to EOSC are uh, two. First is on the national level and the second one is uh, on the international level. Oops, what didn't uh, fit into the previous slide is that there is a, another dimension of this landscape and that's uh, in uh, standards, uh, technologies, tools and uh, also uh, policies because it's also very important to have, uh, uh, have uh, 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 some clear instructions how to, uh, how to proceed with the job. And uh, uh, what are the expectations from, uh, from EOSC? Uh, uh, of course, uh, we hope for ab upgraded data sharing culture. Uh, there are uh, also political and economic aspects because uh, there is a lot of uh, long lasting processes which uh, we hope uh, now may uh, be uh, reach some fruits. And uh, of course, uh, EOSC, that's very much about economy of scale, which means which is based on interoperability, complementarity and cooperation. And uh, the most important thing for the researchers is, of course, uh, widening uh, the availability of uh, data, which we hope will come with a multidisciplinary environment. On the other side, uh, if uh, uh, we, we, we know that it's necessary to take care about both, that economy of scale which comes with centralization, but also uh, about that specialization, specific knowledge uh, which is uh, in different domains. So uh, uh, we don't want to uh, build the black box, but, uh, uh, understandable, uh, uh, but provide understandable data uh, ready for uh, reuse. So that's it. Thank you very much. So thank you very much also for the last presentation. And now, because of these presentations, uh, we created the panel. So now we have uh, we are going to have the panel discussion of all these speakers today. So, but before we go, and I would like to put them also on the stage like that. So I would like to ask you first, uh, dear audience, do you have any questions about what you just heard? So no, oh, perfect. One question, we will start it, just a moment. Yeah, and please introduce yourself. Okay, hi, I'm Stephen Sargent. I'm from the Open University in the UK. I have a question about uh, data stewards. Uh, uh, what you were describing was, uh, it reminded me of something that exists in astronomy. Uh, there is a, a center in Strasbourg 
uh, I won't say the French acronym, it's CDS, um, but they are a data center for the virtual observatory, and they have a specific uh, role there. They call them uh, documentalists, but they sound very much like the, the data steward role that you were describing. And so I was wondering, um, when you design this, this, this really important and interesting data steward uh, role, uh, do you have in mind some of the things that are going on in other disciplines, or is this, uh, are you focusing specifically on the needs within uh, the Czech Republic? So thank you for the question, and Dasha. This works, yeah, it seems to work. Uh, so of course, when we were uh, designing these models and uh, looking at the job role and the uh, list of skills and competencies, uh, we looked at other, what other people are doing. So. Um, we tried uh, not to invent a wheel. Uh, we basically looked what other people were doing, but uh, <coughs> what we're trying to do right now uh, would be to introduce the data stewards uh, in the form of institutional support, so that uh, there would be like two levels, the administrative level, like the open science support centers, who would provide some uh, basic knowledge, basic uh, or more of a universal support, uh, and also a link to the university management, so if there's something that the researchers need, then we can be uh, the link who tells the university management, like, look, there is something the researchers need. Uh, and also another layer of the uh, data stewards at the lab level, so those would be the people who would be assisting the researchers document their data, write the data management plans and things like that. So at the moment, it's mostly at the institutional <coughs> level uh, kind of support. Okay, thank that you. answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. Just I can add the data stewardship wizard was not in fact implemented or invented for the Czech Republic. It was more for the Elixir environment. <laughs> and uh, then we are just, as because it was developed by the Czechs, but now it is especially the collaboration between the Czech and the Netherlands. Uh, and we, we are just trying to push it. But the commission also accepted it as one of the tools which they are promoting uh, for the EOSC in, in, in this particular area. So it is not, uh, it may be a misunderstanding that it is as a Czech, Czech activity. And a reaction from Marek? I would also comment because this uh, virtual observatory documentaries or how it is called are more like data curators. They really take care of the database. So this is slightly different position, even though not perfectly distinguished from data stewards, I would say, at this stage. Okay, thank you. And we have another question from Jessica. Uh, yes, uh, I'm following up actually on that as well. Uh, very great to see Dagmar, what the work that you're doing. And I'm following up on Ludek, what he was saying. So my name is Jessica. I'm uh, LXC Sweden, Deputy Head of Node, and involved a lot in uh, training for the training platform in LXC, but also the Converge project of LXC, which is data management. So exactly the things that you touched upon. So um, really nice to see that you are building upon work or taking into consideration work that is done in other projects. Uh, I know that in UK somewhere, I don't remember, it's not LXC that, but there is personas and competency hub for data stewardship with the different roles and learning paths for different roles um, where you can actually follow the skills depending on, on who you are going to support. But my question was, so, so please look at that, because I think that could be, if you've not seen that, it would, it's really, really good. Um, my question was more, you talked about so data stewardship and then you're supporting researcher, but you touched upon, I think, data stewardship for kind of staff scientists. So if you are from a research infrastructure perspective, so research infrastructure should be there to enable researcher, should support researcher. They don't, staff scientists, not researcher themselves. Do you think that it's data, the support needs to be a bit different if you are working as a data steward within a research infrastructure or if you're working as a data steward towards a researcher? Okay. Uh, I think that in terms of uh, data stewards within data inf oh, research infrastructures, such as we heard about uh, Linda Claria and we heard about uh, the Czech Social Science Data Archive, very often they have some sort of support uh, available for the researchers. 
uh, but there are also many researchers who are not part of any uh, larger research infrastructures, and we think that this is something that the institutional support uh, should should be cover covering. So, sort of a more, um, I'd say, more general uh, kind of role rather than subject or research infrastructure specific. Uh, just a follow-up question then. So in my world, coming from research infrastructure, um, being a staff scientist, the staff scientist also needs teaching training on how do I behave with it, even if I don't own the data I produce, because I produce the data for a researcher, but I'm um, in much need of training so that I can support the researcher down the line. Um, do, uh, how do you in the Czech Republic, do you also train, not only researcher then, but you train staff scientists to understand their data or data stewards? So, yeah. so they will not be data stewards, but they need some type of knowledge to do their work. I'd say not yet, <laughs> not systematically at least. Uh, there are some uh, probably like ad hoc activities. But uh, as part of this uh, working group, we are also discussing, uh, and there's actually a project launched already uh, on a course for data stewards. Uh, and so that would also include like these skills, the training for the uh, research support staff. And final, final thing before Luda comes in. <laughs> I promise I will leave this later. You are part of the task force, I hope, for data stewardship. If not, please join that. Uh, I, I'm not the one leading, but we have one in the advisory group. And there are, is a lot of open training materials that I hope you include in your kind of open library kind of thing uh, for, for your, I mean, all the checks to also take that training. Yes, no, I will shut okay. up, sorry. Thank you for the question. Then I Jessica, to continue. Jessica, I wanted to comment on your question about the difference between the research infrastructure and, and, and say the rest of the researchers. I mean, in my understanding, the research infrastructure is not a closed club. The research infrastructure is to serve also other researchers who may not be directly involved. So from my perspective and from what we are trying to build here, there is no barrier between these two. And in fact, we are also discussing with the ministry not to put any artificial barrier within the project to distinguish between researchers from the institutions who are directly supported by the project and the researchers from other institutions because we claim that we within the project, we are building an environment which has to target all the researchers absolutely regardless of uh, where they are coming from whether they are affiliated with a research infrastructure, whether they are affiliated with an institution which is directly participating in one of the projects which we foresee. So uh, we, we are really looking, trying to look at it this way. And the other, as uh, was said, the, the other thing is that we are already trying to cover the whole research ecosystem. Not only the star researchers, but that's why we call it education and training, because we also go, and, and the goal is to go up to the level of the classical um, university education, to make it a part of the kind of mandatory at, or practically mandatory at the PhD level, and mostly, I mean, selectable at least at the master level, and to give something even at the beginning for the, for the bachelors to understand that there is something like FAIR and data and research data and that there is something which they may look at. So yeah, we are trying to do it and not to create niches or, or, or closed clubs of those who have access and those who are outside. Yeah, thank you. And uh, pass to Jindřich, please, yeah. because he wanted to comment and then Marek. So. Uh, I wanted to say something similar, so maybe just shortly that uh, uh, this uh, this model of uh, s data services is very is usually based on national level, uh, so it's national data services and uh, it comes uh, uh, in many countries. It's it's organized uh, on the network of uh, contact points in universities and institutes, so there are data stewards. And on the other side, uh, there is that national uh, research infrastructure with data services for uh, for uh, for everybody. Uh, this this is not the case for the Czech Republic until now because simply we we we, we are missing or we were missing miss uh, the, the data policy relevant data policy since this. 
So uh, simply, and uh, the, this network of data stewards, uh, that uh, means uh, some costs. So uh, there were no such people until now because uh, there wasn't such, such a requirement on the yeah. universities. So the most of work uh, uh, have to be done uh, by the research infrastructures until now. And uh, that means also the less data are available for research. Okay, then Marek and... Just quickly, because Ludwig already mentioned it, uh, it, we are still a little bit focusing on a position, but it's more like a skill. Yeah, so the idea is to create education in data stewardship. Of course, there will be data stewards, which is a little bit more specific, but data stewardship should be, uh, as mentioned, at least at the level of doctoral candidates, should be as a skill. And it was discussed last week on Kraken conference. Uh, the materials will be available uh, openly? From Kraken will, uh, will be, so, so, Okay, so okay. crack on 2022. 20, yeah. And Pavel? Um. Okay, just a kind of illustration, follow up um, example from one concrete uh, research infrastructure of what the colleagues already said. So, for instance, our repository at lin.claria uh, is a kind of a central repository in the infrastructure. There are others, but our repository is open for submissions from anywhere and from anybody. So anybody who is able to log in via their institutional account from any institution around the world, or even who doesn't have that account can get one fr from Claire and Eric. Basically, as long as you log in via some means, and we'll always find the means, you can make a submission. When you fill in the submission, so imagine something similar to Zenodo, for instance, but the difference is that the, our repository is actually curated, the content. So when you make the submission, it goes to an editor and these editors are actually people who have this experience and training. So we cannot really work as data stewards for the whole world. So we expect the submissions will be uh, curated and you know, prepared correctly. And 95, 99% of them are. But still they are checked by these curators. And if there are problems, then we catch those problems and we communicate with the submitters to improve the submission, for instance, they use the wrong format. Sometimes there is an error in data, you know, uh, things like that. So we do some basic checks, see <coughs> if everything works correctly, if, uh, if the metadata descriptions are correct, if it all kind of seem, seems all right. And this uh, editorial workflow is kind of a, f some collections are managed by the editors from within our infrastructure, but some of them are actually delegated to colleagues from Claire and Eric. So we have editors who actually sit in Netherlands who curate one of the collections. So this is an example of the, of the skills that are kind of used broadly uh, within the infrastructure. We could say as a kind of a fallback for those uh, colleagues who do not have a good uh, um, support at their institution. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question, please. Thank you, uh, two questions. And first a little remark on uh, the notion of documentalist, it is actually a data librarian. So more like it was said on the curation aspect rather than the stewardship within the research unit. And uh, my first question was about the training. Um, on the training tracks you plan to develop, do you plan to include existing formation, uh, training, sorry, um, and even outside Europe, like for example, Codata for my uh, trainings. Okay, who wants to respond to Dasha, please? Yes. It's quite simple, yes. <laughs> okay, okay and, and the other question? The other question is more uh, generic uh, about the national repository. Um, for me, it's not exactly sure what the, um, the process for a researcher looking for data will be uh, looking for some data without uh, already having a specific community uh, repository. Should I be looking uh, in the national metadata repository directory and then I can see the metadata for the data sets and go and find my data? Or should I look on the repository catalog and find the dedicated repository? The, the workflow for the final user wasn't very clear for me. 
Well, I, I, I will start, and, and eventually uh, my colleague will will conclude or continue on that. I mean, the idea is as you described. I mean, we have the top. That's why we are creating. We have even at the top level the catalog of repositories where you can try to look a little bit more. But then you have within the say EOSC Fair Data Scope, you have this national metadata directory. And the idea is that you will start, if you are not knowledgeable, you will start there. And it will help you to navigate through the whole s landscape to get to more detailed, hierarchically built repositories with more uh, information about the data set. That's the way how we, I will, I will explain it from the other way around. If there is a repository already existing, the thematic repository in some case, what we will ask them to do as a part of the whole ecosystem is to provide data I mean, to the national metadata directory, but that will be defined and this will be much less detailed than what they have within their own. We will not ask them to change or to force any standard on them. The only one will be the top level, which will really be more for the navigation. And whoever will, what we will require at the national level, that if you are looking for funding through so this, you have to provide this kind of data to the top level so that your collection, your repository, is actually findable. But no other exposure, and you, you can have your own standards, whatever you want within your area, but through the top level, you will be findable. Mm -hmm. And there will be some requirements on the interoperability and other to actually make sure that if I will find the data there, I will be able to get to them in a say, generally agreed uh, way. But that's beyond the, the, the question, I think. And if yeah. oh, <coughs> I mean, only uh, complement a little bit that uh, you can always, well, if you are in Czech, you can always ask the, uh, the working, uh, the uh, National uh, uh, Library of Technology, the Center for uh, Repositories. And we will maintain the uh, national uh, directory of repositories. These are those in, uh, populated by the results of Czech uh, researchers. However, in the world, uh, there is, for instance, uh, IE3 or data org uh, repository of repositories where you can find where to go. Or so, so there are many options and uh, well, I believe that it's possible. If you don't don't know, you could ask uh, our people that they will give you guidance. Okay, thank you. And uh, Pavel wanted to react on that. Yeah, uh, could you could you put on the slide number fifty eight, possibly? Fifty eight. <laughs> Here it is. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's just an illustration of uh, of how it how it normally works. I think so. And I think it's basically illustration of what the colleagues before me just said. So you have a repository somewhere in the middle, right? So that's the repository, this Clarin D space is, just imagine it's one instance of some repository. And when a submission comes into the repository and it is published, so it gets persistent identifier, it's confirmed to be okay, it's published. So now everybody can see it in the repository, but at the same time, the metadata is harvested automatically by other services. So basically, you can find it in many, many other places. And it kind of doesn't matter how many. That's, that's just a practical question of as long as there is an interesting catalog that where users could come into. For instance, for language data, that would be the one below, Clarin Virtual Language Observatory. That's a catalog of language data that accumulates dozens, maybe hundreds of repositories. But there is a different one, Data Citation Index in Clarin Data Analytics. Open air. That's uh, that's all repositories, uh, data repositories within uh, within the Horizon framework, right? But most of the users, anyway, come from Google. Uh, in our repository, that's that's well below 90%. So you actually have to, should have a good support f to be indexed by Google, right? So so if you go to Google and you look for Prague Dependency Tree Bank, that's just the name of one one of the data sets you will actually find the link to our repository within the first three results. Uh, you go to Google Scholar, you find the data sets there too, if, if the co indexing is done correctly. And that's, at least in our experience, it will definitely vary by the repositories. 
but for our repository, more than 90% of people in the end come from, from generic Google search, actually. So thank you for the comment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have a similar use case uh, than the NMA in France, so it will be very interesting to discuss it. And I'm sorry, I actually have a third question that popped out in my mind, which is, uh, is there a working oh. group or a task in a working group dedicated to evaluation and the link with openness? Marek, you want to comment? Maybe I can say that we will definitely uh, work on it in material sciences. We will probably take it as a specific comment, but there could be other uh, other evaluation, uh, other, other groups which will also take this from a slightly different angle, and then we will collect it later as uh, one topic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you for three questions, and now we go for the question uh, from Eva. Eva Natkova from yeah. the National Library of Technology. I would like to ask, this is connected to the previous questions, what could be the incentives and uh, rewards for sharing data, but also uh, incentives to utilize the existing uh, data sets for the researchers? Tak. Who goes for that? Um. Okay, so I would say that uh, the basic incentives are quite easy. I incentive to utilize the data is that you don't have to create the data, which is very expensive. So if you want to do a research about some particular uh, problem and the data set already exists, then you utilize the data set. Um, similarly, if the data set has already been published about, so if it's already part of some publication, then you can directly compare. So, so that, that part is, I think, I think easier uh, to have your, your work comparable with the other published work uh, and you get the data set for free. Great. And the data, the incentive to publish a data set, that's, that's more tricky part, I would say, but, uh, but there are also in some incentives. And uh, I would say that uh, it very much depends if we follow the um, recommendation by 411. I think, I think it's now part of the FAIR recommendations that you directly cite the data sets. You don't cite only a paper that mentions the data set, you cite the data set directly because that's a, also a research output. And for instance, uh, it often happens that the data set has many co-authors who don't get to be co-authors of a big paper uh, about that, that mentions the data set, you know. So, so as long as the data sets are cited directly, then everybody who participated in creating the data set gets the credit. And I think I think I think that's that's a big part of uh, incentive to publish the data sets that you actually get some real credit. Of course, the institutions have to take care of um, also taking uh, t taking it into account, right? If as long as the institutions only card, uh, count uh, publications that are in impacted journals, then then of course it kind of doesn't. Get, yeah. doesn't get the proper incentive, but, but we can change that culture within our institutions. And just one technical note before we get uh, the Marek answer. Please, Jessica, can you direct it to Taurus room? You have there the camera, you know, already, if you can go there and meet the guy. Yeah, yeah, you, thank you, Marek. Yeah, your okay, answer. this thank is, you. I just follow on Pavel's. Uh, we need now to change and we are already working on it, on changing the uh, culture. There are data, data sets and publications. Publications are interpretations of data sets, and there can be many interpretations of a single data set. So this needs to be, to some extent, separated. That's one thing. And uh, yeah, I actually i am using uh, as an incentive or indication of incentive for openness. I'm using an ex example from uh, uh, COVID pandemic where some labs were very, very open. They didn't, they were publishing really directly from the instruments, uh, their data, and they became famous. And they are, have now quite a good funding, even though they were small groups, relatively local, not very famous and not with much money. And recently, just because of their openness, they were able to expand their research so that that was incentive or reward for their openness. 
Just okay. an example. Thank you. Hindri, you wanted to uh, react? Just a small remark. It was perfect, these explanations, but uh, that's a system of carrot and stick. So we, we shouldn't talk only about carrot. So it's compulsory very often now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any other question on the audience? Okay. In the back, please. Uh, hi, I have a question related not, not only to sharing the data, but sharing also the code used to produce or to manage the data or to analyze the data, which in many cases is extremely important for the reproducibility. Uh, how do you see this challenge? Because it's, it's actually one of the most important challenges, I think. Thank you. Okay, Marek, go on. Well, as I was presenting this fair T uh, idea, of course, if you want to verify the data, you definitely need the code. So within these small communities, you definitely need to share the algorithms or software. And it is done recently already, but usually you have to ask by email. So we will, the, the only part which we are adding is that it will be automatized. But uh, yeah, so, so to, to have your data fair, anyway, you need to have a uh, link to the open software or available software. Okay, Ludek. Yeah. Thank you, I mean, when, when I have more time to present the whole idea about the EOSC in the Czech Republic, I am usually speaking not only about fair data, but about uh, fair digital objects. To, to really emphasize that the data, that the code and other things, workflows, the definitions of these are part of the whole ecosystem. So I fully agree. We currently have no, I mean, I think that no one has a clear idea how to actually deal with it. But one of the ideas where we are looking for kind of an inspiration are things say around the GitHub and other code repositories, how to integrate these activities into the whole ecosystem to make actually sure that at the end, it is not only the data, but it is also the uh, programs, the code, the algorithms, the workflows, which are part of the reproducibility. And like Marek said, I mean, there was, uh, it's not only them, the, for example, the BBMRI and other areas in the research, uh, in the life science and other research infrastructure areas, they are very much emphasizing the need that FAIR is just the core, but we need to go to the quality, we need to go to the provenances, we need to go to all these areas before we actually get all the benefits. But yes, we are starting somewhere, we are changing the mind, we need to make this carrot and stick uh, working as a part of the whole open science area, not only EOSC itself, because this is just, and fair data just is small, although extremely important part of the whole ecosystem, but not the only one and mm, not the only really important part. So yes, definitely the digital objects are there at this moment. Uh, from my perspective, I must admit that when I'm looking at it, I really have the whole landscape, I mean, including the bibliographic data, because for me, they are just another case of, of specific digital objects, which we are more knowledgeable dealing with within the research area, but otherwise, I mean, that's just a part of the same ecosystem. So thank, thank you. And Sorry, I'm just uh, adding a bit of a perspective of the education and training. For example, at Charles University, and I know, know that our colleagues from Masaryk University do the same. When we talk to researchers about research data, we always try to uh, talk about it very broadly so that the term data doesn't cover only uh, the Excel spreadsheets and documents, but it also covers scripts that is used to analyze things, software, but also non-digital data as well, so that the researchers have the idea that data is basically everything that they use in their research. Thank you. I would even broaden it because you also, if you want to assess the quality of the data, you need to have the information on how the data were collected. So we even expanded to standard operational procedures for how the data were collected, analyzed, data coming from the labs, the quality standards for them. And we are already using GitHub to really show everything from the sampling protocols up to the codes for, for the data treatment. Thank you. And Pavel, you wanted to react? Yes. Uh, so it, it's of course complicated, but, uh, but in a way, it's, it's a crucial question, really. So I, I really like the initiative of a research graph that, that's been starting within EOSC 
because because the idea is really to put together all the publications and the data sets and the code into one graph, right? And, it, and it's even more complicated because, because there might be an underlying data set, then you use some piece of software to train a machine learning model, then you use a different piece of software to execute the machine learning model, then you get some inference from that, then you have a derived data set kind of, um, you annotated something, uh, different data set via this, 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 this uh, machine learning model, and then you have some publication. And you should put all these pieces together in the research graph. And as part of fair policies, we should make sure that all of them are preserved. So al also the software. So it's nice to cite a uh, software uh, that is in GitHub, but it's kind of not enough, right? Because in GitHub, it can still be deleted. Whereas the data sets in repositories, they have this crucial facility of once being published, they are not under the researcher's control. They cannot delete it themselves. So, so that's part of the persistency uh, requirement. You, you use the persistent identifier, you still get the object. Of course, you can ask them to be retracted or something, but you cannot just delete them or they cannot disappear because you, you, you leave your position at the university and things like that. Software is usually still cited as being somewhere in some open repository in a version control system. That is nice, but, but still, so, so one option is what uh, Zenodo does, right? So you can, you can make a kind of a, a research object in Zenodo that is linked to a GitHub repository. But the end result is you go to Zenodo homepage now, and it's full of commits from s various software, and it's kind of populated, overpopulated by that, because every new commit uh, gets a version in Zenodo, and during software development, you easily make five commits in a day. Uh, so, so in a year, you make 1,000 commits, you get 1,000 DOIs in Zenodo. That's also probably not ideal. So <coughs> one option would be that uh, only the version that is used to create a data set that is published, so only that version, you know, I've used this version of the software to make that version of the published uh, model. So if you publish the model, you also publish the linked version and preserve it in a repository. And that one gets a DOI, maybe. So, so that's one of the options. It's, I think it's still an open question, but this is, this is kind of the way that, that we, we leave it up to the researchers. So our repository is open, we take software submissions, and this is usually the ones that we get. <laughs> Somebody says, I've, I've published this data set, and I've used this piece of software, you know, but that, that particular revision so I packed the revision and I uh, put it into the repository, something like that. But it's a great question. So thank you very much. And because we are not having time for the last question, so I will do the last question, but in a s little bit different manner in kind of like what we are hoping from the Czech implementation. And as I was, um, watching this presentation, uh, it's stuck in mind uh, actually interdisciplinary and I will direct my final question to Jana and Anna regarding, I find kind of crucial that you are working in, 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 this, in, the, in their dis disciplinary fields, you know. So what are you, what's your hopes to that the EOSC implementation in the Czech Republic will actually bring to your respective fields? Maybe that it won't be very different from Europe because you are <laughs> pointing out that it's a Czech Republic, but I think that we should be well integrated. It's very important to really see what is happening elsewhere and not to try to invent the wheel. Thank you. Uh, so I feel that there's still a lot of question that needs to be answered. So I hope that we will find the answer soon and we will help the researcher in this field manage the, their data. Okay, so thank you very much. So with these hopes for the implementation in the Czech Republic, we end this session. So please, great applause to Luděk, Martin, Dagmar, Jana, not Jiří Vadaňčka, uh, Marek, Jindřich and Pavel. So thank you very much and <laughs> see you at the coffee break. Thank you very much. <laughs>